UFC breakdown. We've got Tai Tuivasa taking on Marcin Tybor in the main event this week. I'll be breaking the card down here, walking through everything that I've built so far in the contest trainer, as well as the Sims tool for Stochastic. As you guys are watching, do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, shout out to Tea Bagging Time 1415 last week. Did a giveaway. It was which fighter for UFC 299 would score the most fantasy points priced under $8,900? That was the price point of Benoit saint -Denis. And the correct answer ended up being Macy Barber. She was priced at $8,800. And uh, teabag in time, maybe doing the simplest thing, just taking the fighter right at $8,800 in Macy Barber, and she ended up being the winner. So teabag in time, you win yourself a free Odd Shopper subscription. DM me on Twitter, or if you're not on Twitter, send me a message below in the comment section here, and I'll uh, find a way to get you set up with your Odd Shopper subscription. The easiest way, though, really is to just DM me on Twitter. I could send you a link. But other than that, let's run it back. Same deal this week. Let me know and for, for this one because it's not quite as many, you know, five-round fights and things along those lines. I think it's more wide open who the top scorer will be. So let me know in the comment section who you think is going to be the top scorer for this week's slate. And once again, I'll give out the winner a, a free subscription to Odd Shopper. So one other recap I want to do is I once again won the $4 last week. That is the fourth time, or sorry, the $3, my bad. That is the fourth time this year that I've won the $3 on DraftKings this year. And what has really, really helped me has been our new Sims tool because it's really helping me identify some unique lineups to get to while also letting me customize it so that I could play the fighters that I really want to roster around. So if you guys have not checked out our Sims package yet for MMA, I really highly recommend signing up using the link that we have below. It also gets you access to our Discord. You could ask me questions whenever you want. And like I said, I've already won the $3 four times this year. Hopefully, many more GPP wins to come. But let's start breaking down the slate here, starting with the main event, Tai Tuivasa taking on Martin Taibora. It is a heavyweight fight. I very highly doubt they're going to need the five rounds. It is a fight, though, that should finish inside the distance, probably within the first round or two. Maybe this fight gets stretched to the third round. And I'll be honest with you guys, I don't have a real strong lean on the fight. If you look at my current exposures here in the Sims tool, I have 50% Tuivasa, I have 49.3% Tybora. As far as the ownership here, and I was also, I was so unsure of who I was going to ultimately end up wanting to pick to win this that I decided like, all right, here's what I'm going to do. Whichever fighter has lower ownership, I'm going to prioritize them in tournaments. And then I go and look at the projected ownership in our contest generator, 35.9% for Tybora, 34.4% on Tuivasa. There's just no real way for me to have a strong lean on this fight. It's a really high variance heavyweight fight. I think it's pretty evenly matched. As far as the, the odds on the betting market, it's right around 50-50. If I was playing one lineup, I would lean a little bit more towards the Tybora side just because he's cheaper. And then also I do think he has multiple paths to win. If the fight takes place on the feet. I think Tuivasa is more likely to win and knock out Tybora, but I don't think that's a certainty. I think Tybora could end up winning on the feet. But if the fight does get to the ground, if Tybora is able to implement a wrestling-based game plan, then I think he is very, very highly likely to win. So if I have to pick a side, I'm going to lean towards Tybora. But I, like I said, in my ownerships here, it's a fight that I'm nearly all in on. I've got... What, 149 of my top 150 lineups are playing one side of the main event. So be all in on this, especially because it's priced in the mid-range. But if you have a really strong lean on the fight, then you're seeing it differently than me. I think this is a very high variance and very competitive heavyweight bout. Co-main event, we've got Brian Battle taking on Ange Lusa. This is my first bet on the card. I bet Ange Lusa plus 150 on the money line. I think it's a really good matchup for him. And I'm surprised how wide the line is here. Because we've seen the way that Brian Battle loses, it's because he gets taken down. He only has a 45% takedown defense. And that's something we've seen Angelusa really prioritize in recent fights. He's landing 2.25 takedowns per 15 minutes. But look at what he did in his last fight against Reese McKee. He ended up landing six takedowns. And then on top of that, he had six minutes of control time. He ended up outstriking Reese McKee. Total strikes 124 to 90 in that spot. I could see this fight looking very similarly when all is said and done in this matchup. So Angelusa to me, uh, much too wide of an underdog. He's one of my favorite underdog plays for DraftKings purposes this week. I currently have him about a third of my lineups. And he's not projected for all that much ownership, 24% ownership going to Angelusa. So I like being overweight to him. I like betting on him on the money line. I've really strongly considered betting him by decision as well, but it just wasn't enough points added to it. He was around, uh, I think, plus 210 to win by decision the last I looked at it. So when I consider that I was able to get his money line at plus 150, 
I figured that, you know, you never know with MMA. There could be a submission that ends up happening. There could be a knockout. It wasn't enough added points for the for the money line, uh, or for the money line compared to the decision win. So I'm going to pick Angelus to win by decision, bet him on the money line at plus 150. I think it's a good matchup for him for DFS purposes. Next fight here, Ovin St. Pru taking on Kennedy and Sechiku. And I can't believe OSP is still fighting in the UFC. He has had a uh, brutal stretch of fights in the later stage of his career. I know he had the split decision win over Shogun Hua, but that was just two wash fighters. It was a terrible, terrible fight. Uh, but then fights before that, we are after this one at least. Felipe Lins knocked out OSP. That's also not a great look for him. Before that, he got knocked out by Tanner Bozer. He got knocked out by Jamal Hill. He did have a win over Alonzo Menafield. That comes all the way back in 2020, which probably the most recent decent performance we've seen out of OSP, and that was four years ago now at this point. So taking on Kennedy and Sechiku, he's going to be at this point a much more athletic fighter. He also has a lot more length than OSP has. And then on top of that too, just youth is going to be on his side. OSP to me at this point in his career, more so showing up for a paycheck. We're going to see Kennedy and Sechiku two-inch reach advantage, uh, sorry, three-inch reach advantage, two-inch height advantage. And then also just so much more output on the in Sechiku's side. He lands 4.86 significant strikes per minute. One of the biggest issues with OSP throughout his career, even when he was a fighter who was ranked towards the top of the light heavyweight division, there was just never a lot of output. And he's always been a fighter that's kind of relying on finishes. And it's hard to bank on that when you only land 2.71 significant strikes per minute. So picking Kennedy and Sechiku to win. As far as DraftKings goes, though, it is kind of hard to get to him. He's the most expensive fighter on the card, so I only have him in 17% of my lineups right now. Now, with that said, he's not expected to be all that popular, only picking up 15% ownership. In some of these recent cards, I have had a lot of success by targeting some of the lesser-owned pay-up options. Like last week, somebody who really helped me elevate my lineups was uh, Mataj Gamrot. He ended up being the highest score on the slate at modest ownership, and I was well overweight to him. The week before was Ludovic Klein. I just don't see a similar angle like that this week with Kendi and Sechiku. I pick him to win, but I'm kind of skeptical that he has that same like 130 fantasy point upside that we saw out of fighters like Klein and Gamrot. Moving on, and this is my favorite fight on the entire card. Christian Rodriguez against Isaac Dolgarian. And Dolgarian's very green in his MMA career. He only has six professional fights. He's won all of them. He's looked super impressive in all of them as well. We've slowly seen him see increased competition with each of his fights. His last fight, he looked great against Francis Marshall. We ended up seeing Dolgarian get the finish in the first round with elbows. He landed a takedown, 35 significant strikes in total. If you look at the control time as well, I mean, he got the takedown at the start of the round. They held four plus minutes of control time. So basically the entire time the fight took place, it was with Dolgarian in top control, landing ground and pound, 35 significant strikes, 61 total strikes. Step up in competition for him here. No doubt we have Dolgarian going up against, as I click on the wrong tab here, we've got Dolgarian going up against Christian Rodriguez, which is definitely the, the biggest test that we've seen of his entire career to this point. And I think Christian Rodriguez is a good youngish fighter, but here's one issue we've seen with Christian Rodriguez is he's kind of been viewed as a barometer for a lot of these younger fighters. And for the most part, we've seen Christian Rodriguez come out on top. We saw him be somebody who was supposed to be a winnable matchup for Joel Rosas Jr. What ends up happening, Rosas had success in the first round, but this had nothing left in the gas tank by the time we got to the second and third round, which is why Rodriguez won that fight by decision. But there was some concerning signs for me when it came to Christian Rodriguez in that fight. Notably, in the first round, we saw Hal Rosas Jr. land three takedowns and had four minutes of control time in that first round before he tired out. Dolgarin has not shown signs of be somebody who tires out as the fight gets into later stages. Anytime that we've seen him in fights, he's been really active. He's never slowed down. So I think we could see the kind of pace and success that Rosas had in the first round against Christian Rodriguez. I think Dolgarin could actually keep that up for all three rounds of this fight. So with that being the case, Dolgarin's one of my favorite overall fighters to target on this card. It is a little bit speculative because we haven't seen him against this level of competition. and We haven't really seen him extended at the UFC level, but my intuition tells me that he is going to be able to keep up that pace. And that is why I currently have Dolgarian in 44% of my lineups. He's expected to be a chalk option. I understand why. And in a win, he looks like somebody who's going to score extremely well on DraftKings. If you look at his numbers overall, I mean, North of seven significant strikes landed per minute, three takedowns landed per 15 minutes. So I was like, Gary, one of my favorite mid-range plays that we have on the entire slate. Yeah, the only fighters I have more exposure to are two fighters in the main event in Tibor and Tuivasa, a fight that I ended up splitting. So uh, give me Dolgarian, one of the best options on the slate. 
Next fight we have here. It is one that I don't really think we need to be targeting. Panny Kanzad taking on Macy Chasson. This fight is right around minus 350 to go to the judges' scorecards. So with that in mind, Chasson probably would need a finish at her price point to be in an optimal lineup. That betting odds just indicate that's not all that likely. And then as far as the Kanzad side, she just doesn't do all that much. She has okay 71% takedown defense on paper, but she is coming off... Well, I shouldn't say coming off because two fights ago, she had a, a pretty devastating knee injury. So we saw her come off an ACL surgery against Ketlin Vieira. And Vieira landed three of three takedowns and held over 10 minutes of control time. I could see something really similar to Chasson here. She's going to be hunting for takedowns. She's much bigger physically than Panny Kanzad. So I think we could see a similar looking fight. And for Ketlin Vieira in that particular fight, you know, she's somebody who is also a little bit more active than Chasson is. So she landed the 65 total strikes. So Kanzad was sound defensively in terms of she didn't really get threatened to give up submissions in that fight. She can give up a whole lot of damage on the ground, but she also had no real opportunities to win at any point. So I'm going to pick Chasson to win, picking her to win by decision, but not a great fight to target for DFS. Next fight that we have here, it is Gerald Mearshart taking on Brian Barbarena. And I love this matchup for GM3. Brian Barbarino only has 49% takedown defense on paper. When Mearshart wins, he almost always scores well for DraftKings purposes. Just the way that he wins his fights, it's generally with takedowns. It's also by finishing fighters with submissions. So when you look at Gerald Mearshart's career and his wins, he had the win over Bruno Silva, which he won by submission. He submitted Dustin Solfoots. He submitted Mahmoud Muradov. He submitted Bartosz Fabinski. And that's how I think this fight is going to play out as well. Brian Barbarena, especially at this point in his career, now he's fighting up at 185 pounds, but he's just not physically big enough, in my opinion, to be a 185 pounder. And if you look at some of these spots, you know, he fought against Mahmoud Muradov, who's not known as a wrestler and grappler. Mordov landed 13 takedowns against Brian Barbarena, and most of it was just because he was so much bigger and physically stronger than Barbarena. The fight before that, Barbarena took on Gunnar Nelson, got taken down once, got submitted. RDA took down Brian Barbarena four times before submitting him. That's what I think is going to happen in this fight, too. Probably a few takedowns in the early going by Gerald Mearshart, first or second round submission, picking him to win the fight, and also a payup option that I like quite a bit. I've got Mearshart right now in 39% of my lineups which him and uh, Tiago Moises we're going to talk about in a little bit. Those are the two payup options that I do have the most exposure to on this card if we're talking about the fighters who are in that, you know, like 9K range. Next fight here, we have Natan Levy taking on Mike Davis. And in general, I do like Mike Davis as a fantasy scorer. I'm just not sure for this particular matchup that he's going to have all the advantages that he might usually have where we do see a lot of output on the feet from Mike Davis, 5.83 significant strikes landed per minute. He absorbs 6.2. But Natan Levy's not a fighter that keeps a super high pace on the other side. He lands 4.01 significant strikes per minute. And then also, some of the numbers on Mike Davis are inflated. I'll show you guys why. So Mike Davis's last fight was against Vyacheslav Borchev. If you guys have watched Borchev fight, he's very entertaining. When fights take place on the feet, he has zero takedown defense, arguably the worst takedown defense in the UFC. So Mike Davis lands nine takedowns in that fight, but his previous fights, he landed three against Mason Jones, he landed two against Thomas Gifford, a fight that really never should have happened. I'm no surprise he didn't have any takedowns against Gilbert Burns and no takedowns against Sadiq Youssef either. So I don't know this is a fight where he's going to be looking for takedowns. I think it's going to take place mostly on the feet. I think Mike Davis is better pretty much in every category compared to Natan Levy. I think he could win this fight on the feet if it was a wrestling match. I probably would favor Mike Davis a little bit. I just don't think that is the path he's going to go towards. If somebody is going to be more aggressively hunting takedowns, I think it probably would be Levy, who lands 5.37 takedowns per 15 minutes. So the way I think this fight plays out, it's probably going to be on the feet. It's going to score okay for DraftKings purposes. But compared to fighters like Tiago Moises, Gerald Mearshard, or uh, Jeff L. Fialo, who are also, who's also priced in that upper 8K range, it's hard for me to prioritize Mike Davis. So Davis is currently in 20% of my lineups, a little bit underweight to the field to him when he's projected for 30% ownership. And then Levy's not really an underdog. I have all that much interest in. He is in... Where's Levy? Yeah, it looks like I'm not really getting any lineups at all with Natan Levy at the moment, which I don't have any issue with. I am okay with not having him in my portfolio. So moving on to see what else we have to look at on the card. About halfway through right here. Next fight, Josie Ann Nunez taking on Chelsea Chandler. 
uh, low-key, kind of a good fight to target. It's one that is favored to, very slightly favored, to finish inside the distance. And this is a kind of version of a striker versus grappler matchup. The reality is neither of these fighters are particularly good at anything. But Josie Ann Nunez also, she is so tiny for the division. She's only five foot two. Chelsea Chandler, five foot eight, so half a foot taller. And we saw a big issue for Josie Ann Nunez in her last fight against Zara Pham, where Nunez is the much better overall fighter. She ended up winning the fight by decision, but Farron was so much taller than Nunez that Nunez could barely reach her face to, to land any kinds of hooks or uppercuts or anything like that. So it was a real issue for Josie Ann Nunez landing with any kind of power in that spot. And as far as Chelsea Chandler goes, I don't know that she's going to look to wrestle and grapple, but if she does, she could put up a really big DraftKings score. We saw Chandler fight against uh, Julio Storliorenko in her UFC debut. And what ended up happening in that fight, Storliorenko, who, as we know, she's basically a first round arm bar or bust type of fighter. She either gets an arm bar in the first round or she doesn't and she loses. So she ends up landing the takedown against Chelsea Chandler, but Chandler was able to reverse position, got top control, and just ground and pound Stuli Orenko, had very good control from the top position, and was able to pound her out. If we see Chandler get on top against Nunez, I think she's just going to trap her. I think she's going to be able to unleash some pretty vicious ground and pound. That is the one aspect of Chandler's game, which is pretty decent. So uh, I'm going to favor Chandler to win the fight. And I also like her a little bit for DFS purposes when you consider that if you look at the projected ownership we have, we have Nunez projected to be fairly popular here. Yeah, 36%, 36% projected ownership on Nunez, whereas Chandler's coming in at 25%. So it's a pretty good fight to target in the mid-range. I think that if Nunez wins, pretty good chance it's a knockout. If Chandler wins, I think it's a pretty good chance it comes by ground and pound in a TKO. And I'm leaning towards the Chandler side because she's the much lower owned of the two fighters in this matchup few fights left to talk about and also for this card like I know on paper it's not great but it's pretty fun for DFS purposes I think there's a lot of really high variant spots and individual fights that I do like to target for DFS like that Nunez Chandler fight and another one here Jafel Fielo taking on Ode Osborne and Osborne on paper 68% takedown defense but one of the big issues I have with Osborne he's very passive he doesn't really do a whole lot. He does end up fighting to the level of his competition pretty frequently. And Fialo is a much better submission grappler. So if Fialo is able to get this fight to the ground, he's a chance to score massively for DraftKings purposes. And if he doesn't get the takedowns, I think Osborne could end up knocking him out. So uh, another fight that I think is decent to target. Filo right now is one of my most rostered fighters on the entire card. I have him in... Where was it? Yeah, 39.3% of lineups, so actually the same amount that I have Gerald Mearshart in, and just a handful of fighters that I like building around in this high range. Philo, Mearshart, Moises, Dolgarian, and maybe not necessarily the high range, but these fighters are all priced between, what, 8,500 to 9,200. That's a price range I do like to be in for this week. Lots of fighters with upside, and for this fight, when it's any of these kind of grappler versus striker matchups, I'm generally going to favor the grappler, because when they are able to control where the fight takes place, there's just so much less variance for a grappler once they're in top position, where if a fighter is needing the fight to be on the feet to win, there's a lot of variance that could happen in those scenarios. So I'm picking Fielder to win. I like him to win by submission, probably in the first or second round. Osborne, not dead as an underdog, but I am favoring the Filo side of the fight. Uh, Josh Coolibau against Danny Silva. Danny Silva, I don't know if he tried to make weight today, but he didn't come close. He missed weight by three and a half pounds. And it's a little bit concerning because it was such a big weight miss because is it, did he miss weight because he strategically didn't try to make weight or did he miss weight because he's a little bit out of shape and maybe he's dealing with some sort of underlying injury that we're not aware of. It's a little bit concerning, but all I really know is what I could go off of based on tape as well as the data. And Danny Silva fights at an incredibly high pace. And here's another fight that I like betting on. You could bet this at plus 120 to finish inside the distance. I think that's a really good bet for this fight because the way Danny Silva fights, crazy amount of pace and pressure. If you look at his fight on Contender Series, he landed 13.6 significant strikes per minute. He absorbed 13.13. He also landed two takedowns in that fight. So a crazy amount of pressure by Danny Silva. Incredibly hittable as well. He absorbed a ton of damage, obviously, to absorb 13.13 significant strikes per minute. If you look at the stats from that fight against uh, Angel Pacheco, Silva lands 204 significant strikes. Pacheco lands 197. And surprisingly, I think partially because of what the betting odds are, this is not a fight that's picking up a lot of ownership. We've got Danny Silva projected for 15% ownership. 
We've got Cooley Bow projected for where's Josh Cooley Bow? Here he is. Cool about project for 14% ownership. I like being overweight to both sides, but Silva's one of my overall favorite value options on the slate, just because from what we saw out of him on the contender series, he's somebody who looks like he profiles the score very well on wins in DraftKings. And that's something I like to target for underdogs. It's not necessarily, are they going to win? Because somebody like Angelus, I think the line is wrong and I'm picking him to win outright. But for a fighter like Danny Silva, it's not necessarily that I think he wins outright, but it's more so that when he does win, I think he scores really big and lands in an optimal lineup. So I am going to pick him to win over Cooley Bow, but Cooley Bow is also live for a knockout in this spot. And considering the low ownership on both sides, I like being overweight to it. It's my favorite contrarian spot on the card. Jacqueline Amarine taking on Corey McKenna. And here's how I see this fight going. Amarim has shown to be a little bit of a gasser in her UFC career. Her UFC debut against Sam Hughes, Amarim totally dominated the first round, had no cardio left for the second or third round, ends up losing. She nearly got the finish in the first round, but Sam Hughes was able to end up fighting it off. Then against uh, Montserrat Canejo, we did see Amarim's cardio look a little bit better, but the bar was so low because her cardio was so shitty in the fight against Sam Hughes. And then also there was no, just zero resistance from Conejo in that spot at all, where Conejo was just kind of pulling guard, letting Amarim sit on top of her. So yeah, she could definitely fight for three rounds when the opponent offers zero resistance, but I don't think that's going to be the case with Corey McKenna. And McKenna also is shown to have pretty questionable fight IQ, but here's how I think the fight goes. I'm hoping that both these fighters are looking to engage in wrestling and grappling scenarios, because if they do, I think that Amarim is live for a first round submission. And if she doesn't get it, I think she probably tires and McKenna wins a grappling and wrestling based decision. Maybe she gets a late submission in the third round if Amarim ends up totally gassing out. The betting line has gotten super inflated at this point. McKenna is now nearly a minus 200 favorite, minus 175 at the time that I'm recording. But every time I check the line, it's moving another five, 10 points in favor of Corey McKenna. So I think this is a decent fight to target in the mid range on DraftKings. I've got Corey McKenna right now in 22% of lineups, and then uh, Amarim in 18% of lineups in the mid-range. Uh, so that actually does have me a little bit underweight to the field, but still, it is a fight that is showing up in some lineups. I wouldn't mind doing an ROI boost, getting me a little bit more of Amarim and McKenna in this spot, just because I do think it's going to be a wrestling and grappling-based fight. Uh, so I'm going to pick McKenna to win, but relative to ownership, Amarim is quite a bit less popular than McKenna, and that's probably only going to be even more so in our next ownership projection update because of the way that the betting line keeps trending. I'll bet Amarim, if Amarim ends up being like a plus 150 and McKenna swells to north of minus 200, then I'll have to consider Amarim at that price point because that would be too wide of a line. But as it goes right now, decent fights target in the mid-range. I'm going to pick McKenna to win by decision. Tiago Moises taking on Mitch Ramirez on short notice. And a really, really tough fight for Ramirez to be taking here on just about a week's notice. He got KO'd on the contender series by Carlos Praches, and Praches made his UFC debut taking on, who did he fight? It was recent. It was, let me check again, just, right. It was Trevin Giles, and we saw Praches get the second round finish in that fight, but it was not an impressive performance, which I also think kind of lowers the stock of Mitch Ramirez, who also got finished by Praches in the second round of that fight. There just wasn't a lot of output from Praches in the fight against Trevin Giles. This is a spot where I think Moises should be able to win the fight no matter where it goes. If it takes place on the feet, Moises is typically a little bit low output on the feet, but I think he's the more well-refined striker than Ramirez is. And then this is, if this fight does happen to get to the ground, Moises is just the far superior submission grappler. I could see him winning by submission. And that should be the game plan of Moises in this fight. He should look to wrestle. He should look to grapple, particularly against a fighter who's taking this fight on just about a week's notice. I expect Moises to have the better cardio. If he looks to wrestle and grapple, I think he does get a submission and probably scores pretty well on DraftKings. So I do have him currently in, let's see, at 41% of lineups is uh, Tiago Moises. Project for only 19% ownership, so I'm quite a bit overweight to him, as well as Gerald Mearshart, who's projected for 20% ownership. None of these fighters in the high range are projected for like the 40 or 35% ownership for, for uh, this slate in the way that we've seen like Umar Namagomedov on recent slates, or uh, let me think, who last week was projected for super high ownership? I know O'Malley was, and um, there was like another fighter as well. So there's no real pivot in the high range, but... If you're looking to figure out who to prioritize here, once again, Bulgarian, Moises, Mirashart, Fialo, those are the favorites that are landing in my lineups most frequently.
And the final fight on the card is one that uh, really doesn't require all that much discussion. We've got uh, Gregorio taking on Chad and Hellinger. And I worry about the output in this spot. I know on paper, Gregorio lands 13 significant strikes per minute because of what he did on the Contender Series. But still, he's 8-3 and three as a professional. He's not all that young either. He turns 32 years old this month. And then Chad and Hellinger, super old at this point. And Hellinger is 37 years old. He's going to be turning 38 this year. So just based on age, I'm going to be favoring the Gregorio side. He is a slight favorite in this spot. And then another thing, too, that just has me off of this fight is uh, it's a fight that is expected to go to decision or at least close to it. It's about a pick to go to decision. And if it does go to decision, both these fighters who traditionally do fight at fair low outputs, uh, especially and Hellinger only landing 3.07 significant strikes per minute. And now he's also really aged. So if you look at Ann Hellinger, he got subbed by Jose Johnson. His last fight only landed 26 significant strikes against Alatang Haile. He lost by decision. He landed 39 significant strikes he fought jesse strader who just doesn't belong in the ufc at all and we saw chad and hellinger did land two knockdowns before getting the finish in the third round but still low output 47 significant strikes when he fought on the contender series in a split decision 67 significant strikes in a late third round finish over jesse strader so i don't think this fight is going to score all that well unless there's an early finish and the betting odds indicate that's not all that likely and i tend to agree with that so that's going to do it for me, guys. If you have not done yet, do me a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to leave a comment below. Which fighter is going to score the most fantasy points on the slate? Whoever gets the answer right, I'm going to randomize it. Well, if it's only one person, then you just win. But if it's multiple people, I'll randomize it. Pick a winner. I'll announce it on next week's card, and you get yourself one free month of Odd Shopper Premium. And then also, don't forget, if you want to sign up for our Sims package at Stochastic, it's going to be really profitable in MMA this year. I won the $3 150, con 150 entry contest on DraftKings for the fourth time last week. And I wouldn't have been able to do it without the help of the Sims tool. So sign up using the link below if you guys haven't checked it out yet. Other than that, enjoy the card this week. Good luck. See you back here next week.